Amen. Have a seat. Thank you for the water. Whoever brought that up here. So I didn't clarify. If you are um, a visitor with us here, you're not a visitor very long. Your family, we love you guys. I'm glad you're here. Our head pastor, Pastor Dustin Shane, they are on sabbatical. Um, so they've got just two more weeks and they'll be back. I'm the associate pastor. My name's Hayden Dennis. Um, and we have been in a series. This is week three, but the cool thing is if you miss the first two weeks, it's okay. You're not going to be lost. Um, cause each week it is building on what's next. Um, but you're not going to be lost because you wasn't here. Um, with that being said, who was here last night at the, they had almost 300 here at the big house worship night. Yeah. How cool is that? That's awesome. Uh, I know raised some money for Big House, which is awesome, doing great things. So we were excited for that last night. Um, I think it'd be cool just to have a camera up in here for all these events and just watch stuff come and go. And sometimes we move all the chairs and put them back in one day and all these things. One of these days, maybe we'll do that. But uh, no, I'm excited to, to, to preach this today. I don't know that we'll get through everything. But the cool thing is, if I don't, you just got to come back next week. All right. Um, so I'll just have to probably stop. I might get through it all, but we'll just see. But to recap what we've talked about, week one was the rapture of the church. Um, I believe that's the next big event that's going to happen. Yeah, we're going to see we're going to see wars. We're going to see stuff that's happening like right now over there with Hamas, and we're going to see this stuff. But I think the next big world event is the rapture of the church. I think we're next. Um, yeah, woohoo! I don't know who said that, but I'm I'm eagerly waiting for his return. And we talked about this Wednesday night. If you're eagerly waiting for his return, there's a crown for you. So, be eagerly watching and waiting for him to come. Um, last week we covered the two judgments, the judgment seat of Christ, which is what the believers will will uh, will go through. Everybody will face judgment. Believers go to the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture. And then at the very end, there's a great white throne judgment that we'll get to, but we talked about last week. So that was last week. So what's next for the church? For us would probably be the marriage. We've talked all week about us being the bride and being the bride of Christ and the church is his bride and he's gonna call it up. And so the next thing for, for us is the marriage, um, the marriage of the lamb. And so I wanna talk about that today. We're gonna start with that. And then once we, there's really not a lot, if you've studied it, there's not a lot in there to really clarify. I can't stand here and say, here's what it's going to be like. All I can stand here and say is it's going to be awesome. And that's the only thing I can clearly stand here and say, that it's going to be the most amazing event, the most amazing thing that we have ever witnessed. And we're not only part of, like, we're part of it. And so we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about kind of what's happening in the world for the people that was not raptured. So that's where we're going. There were some notes handed out. They're just um, a lot of the scriptures I'm gonna cover. So that way you can take notes if you like. But Jesus prophetically referred to the, this, uh, the parable of the marriage feast in Matthew 22, one through 14. So this is Jesus talking about what's gonna happen with us. And I told you guys last week, if you were here, when you're reading Matthew, I, I said, I said this out loud probably, and I said Matthew could almost still be in the Old Testament because mainly he's talking to the Jews. But right here in verse two, you can find out he's talking to me and you. And so listen to, to Matthew 22, one through 14. This is the parable of the marriage feast. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parable saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So right there, kingdom of heaven, that's for me and you. When he says the kingdom of God or your, my kingdom on earth, that's when he's talking to the Jews. So he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is me and you. So he's talking to us, the king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner and my ox, my fat and livestock and all that were butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and they went on their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. They, rest, and they seized the slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murdered, 
those murderers and set their city on fire. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways as you find there, invite, the wedding fe- invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came and he looked over the dinner guests, he saw a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into outer darkness, into that place where weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So this is Jesus talking about this marriage that we're getting ready to be a part of. In verse 2, who's it say the wedding feast is for? His son. His son. In verse 3, it goes on and starts talking about the unwilling to come, been invited, unwilling to come. Who did not see him when he first came? His brethren, the Jews. They missed him. They, were un, they, they missed him. They were unwilling to come. That's who he's talking about here. It goes on down in verse 6. So now we're talking about the wedding feast, right? And they paid no attention. They started going on with life as normal, right? But then what happened? They seized the slaves and they started mistreating them. Guys, this is what's going to happen. Anti-Semitism is on a rise in America right now, and it has no, it can't even hold a candle to what's going to happen after the church is raptured. So it's mistreating these people. It's mistreating the Jews. It's at an all-time high, and it's getting worse. It goes on down to verse 11. Did you guys catch that when it said this person was sitting there not dressed in wedding clothes? It's the Antichrist. He's not dressed in wedding clothes. So what's he do? If you guys know the end of the story, what are they? You go on down. It talks about it in verse 13. They bind him, right? They bind him and throw him into the lake of fire forever. The serpent, the Antichrist. So we're going to talk about all this. And this is Jesus referring to our, what's going to happen at the end times for us through this, this marriage, through this union, and what's going to happen with the Jewish people. And see, what's cool about it is he reveals it all again in Revelation 19. So it's not just a prophecy by Jesus, but it shows up again in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. And what's, if you have your Bible, the little title above says what? The marriage of the Lamb. So listen to what it says there. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These words, these are true words of God. So let's break it down here. Verse 7, made ready. I told you guys last week, I maybe talked about it during when we were talking about the rapture. There's going to be one person that's going to accept Jesus Christ, and the fulfillment of the church is ready. It's ready. There's going to be one last person. It could have been one of those two people that accepted Christ last Sunday right here. We don't know. Two people got saved last Sunday, two teenagers. After, like, one at service, one right after. They could have been the last one. The time the Gentiles could have been fulfilled, and we could not be here today. We could already be celebrating this. This is why we got to teach this stuff, and we got to, like, so we know to tell people. But it said that the time the Gentiles became full, the last one is accepted. Who will it be? It goes on in verse 8. talks about we'll be dressed in fine linen, bright and clean. We're going to talk about this is going to come up later if we get there today. But remember that, that we're dressed in fine linen. Remember that we're, we're bright and clean. Verse 9, it goes on to say, What blessed are those who are invited? Is the bride ever invited to the wedding? No. She has a place there. Guys, we're not invited to the wedding. We are the wedding. The ones invited to the wedding, Old Testament saints, tribulation saints. Okay, we're going to get there here in a minute, how that's going to pan out. Tribulation saints, all the people that accept Christ after the church. Listen, If you want to be the bride of Christ, if you want to be in the church, you have to be saved before the tribulation. There's nobody going to be part of the church after the tribulation. I'm not saying you're not going to make it there. You're not going to be part of the bride of Christ. That will be done 
at the rapture of the church. Then if you make it through tribulation or accept through that, then you're going to be an invited guest to the wedding. You're not going to be part of the wedding. This marriage of the lamb, right? It's what it says. Marriage of the lamb. It doesn't say marriage of the bride. I think that's very important to make sure and get in our minds that it's a marriage of the lamb. It's not a completion of our hopes as a bride to marry him, even though I'm excited for this. I don't know what it means, but I'm excited. But see, it's not so much a completion of that, but it's a completion of what God said from the beginning, what he was going to do for his son. That's why it's called the marriage of the lamb. It's God's plan for his son that was arranged before the foundation of the world. Does that not blow your mind? You know, we always hear and we always say that, well, you know, he had me on his mind when he's making the world, did he? What's Ephesians 1, 4 say? Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Do you guys hear that wedding talk? What happens when you get married to somebody? Right? We become one. So in Ephesians 1, it says that he chose us before the foundation of the world. Chose us to be part of him, married to him, a union to him before the foundations of the world. Guys, that's awesome to think about. The marriage wouldn't even be possible if he didn't come in to be a man on earth. Think about this. What do we, what do we talk about all the, all the time? That God does nothing that's contrary to nature. This wouldn't be a, 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 a rightful union if Christ would never came and become man, right? Everything God does is, is lines up. It's not contrary to nature. This is why Jesus took his human nature back to heaven with him. Have you ever thought about that? In 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, there is one God, one mediator also between God and men, right? So he's been taken up. He's the mediator. But what's it call him? the man, Christ Jesus. It doesn't say he's the mediator, Christ Jesus. It says he's the mediator, man, Christ Jesus. So he took his human form back up there. I read this out of a book. Uh, actually, it's Clarence Larkin is the quote. And listen to what he says. He says, while the bride was chosen for Christ before the foundations of the world, the espousal could not take place until Christ assumed humanity and ascended to heaven as man, Christ Jesus. Then there has been many long patrols, but Christ has been the longest on record. He's been waiting for his bride over 2,000 years, but he will not have to wait much longer. Soon heaven will resound with a cry. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come. He's been waiting a long time for his father to say, go get your bride. Are you waiting and watching? Are you telling people that, guys, it, it can happen? Like, I told you before, there's nothing prophetically to, in, to me, the way I read scriptures, that has to happen before he gets his church. It's imminent. It can happen anytime. Once 1948, once Israel got their land back, he could have come from then on. All right? We're in that time. It's going to be a joyful occasion, this marriage. Like I told you, I can't even imagine what it's going to be. Like, there's not enough really in there to even talk about, but it's gonna be such a happy time. It's gonna be a feast. It's gonna be a celebration. Like, I mean, I'll be honest. Like, isn't it kind of fun to go to weddings? I know that's kind of weird to say. I used to take pictures at them. I didn't think it was so much fun. It felt like work. But literally, go to like a really nice wedding, joyful occasion. Isn't it awesome? Like, it really is. You see people starting their lives. I mean, like, unless you get in a fight with the bride or the groom and the best man, uh, I've, I've, I've heard stories where that happens. Um, that's for a different day. But the one laughing was a part of it. And his brother was the other part. Um, but anyways, but think about those. It's such a happy day. It's such a happy time. And, you know, it, it goes by fast. And that's what I think this is going to be. We're getting called up. We're going through that judgment. It doesn't say how long the judgment seat of Christ takes. But I don't think it matters. God's time and our time, you can't even compare them. You can't even compare them. So we can't talk about, well, this is weird. We're going to be like getting ready for the wedding for seven years. Because once the church is raptured, there's a lot of stuff happening here on earth. And we're going to, and I don't even want to call it a highlight because like that's not even right. 
it'd be a low light if anything but i'm going to try to cover what's happening on earth now that we're gone now that we're having this celebration see the church gets raptured in my opinion around revelation 4 i don't believe we're mentioned again till the end i believe in revelation 4 the church is gone and I believe that it's going to get played off. We talked about this a little bit on week one. You know, we, th we can think, oh, it's going to decimate the world. I hope it does. I hope it does decimate. I mean, you know, we all, they always say they can't find the U.S. in the end times in Revelation. Well, maybe it's because there's enough Christians here that once we're gone, the place just crumbles. We're really close right now, and we're here. I mean, I often wonder how much longer we're going to be a country anyways, but you take out all the Christians, and you take out the Holy Spirit— I don't know that there's any hope for it. That's why I don't think it's mentioned. But I think that, I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. This is where we go off the rails, and I won't jump on it too long. I've talked to a lot of people about it. I believe that, like right now, if you watch the news, the last couple of years, what has been coming up through and being released by government agencies? This is where everybody walks out. UFOs. What better way to play off all of us narrow-minded people gone then these aliens coming down, which aliens is not aliens, they're demons, and they're, they're clearing the world, they're clearing the aura, they're getting all these narrow-minded people out of the way so we can live a peaceful, awesome life. As there's no, it can't be a coincidence that the government is releasing this stuff, not just our government, all of them. But I think, you know, I think we can say, oh, it's going to decimate, but how quickly will they forget? They're going to, however they play it off, however they play off how all of us disappeared, People will forget so fast. And that doesn't necessarily, like I said, this marriage, our marriage time, we're raptured. That doesn't mean that the, the, the end times clock starts. I mean, it basically does, but really what starts the end times clock, and this is why I think it's going to get played off the most, is because there's a man common of peace. Now, it's a false peace, but it's not going to seem like a false peace. So there's this man common. And we talk about, you know, this narrow-minded people. And, I mean, you look at, like, some of the young people, they fall into this spiritual, like, everything's just about being spiritual and cleaning your aura. And it's just new world teachings. Like, that's what they teach. And it falls right into what the Antichrist is going to be doing. Okay? And he's coming on the scene. Now, when he steps on the scene, this leader, this man of peace, that starts the clock. That starts the prophetic clock that I believe is seven years. And I can show you in Daniel 9.27 why I believe that. In Daniel 9.27, it says, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. This he is referring to the Antichrist, okay? For one week, but then in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even into complete destruction one that is decreed is poured out than one who makes desolate. So one week is seven years, okay? We read it as one week. Um, everybody that studies this, this is the seven-year tribulation. And the he that comes to make this covenant, this man of peace, he comes on the scene, and that starts this one week, this seven years, okay? And he comes in with peace. And it says in the middle of the week, he puts a stop to the sacrifice. I told you guys, I totally believe once we're gone, it goes back to sacrifice. Do you know Jews hasn't made a sacrifice since the new covenant started, which was Jesus Christ? They don't have no temple. They can't do sacrifices. They have zero hope right now. An honest Jew, a full-blooded Jew has zero hope unless they accept Christ, and they can they cannot even sacrifice right now because they don't even have a temple yet. And so it says here, halfway through, he cuts off the sacrifices again. See, he makes this. In Matthew 24, it talks about in the first three and a half that that temple will be rebuilt. If you guys study anything in Israel right now, they have everything they need for that temple. They can build that temple in no time. It has no bathrooms. It has no, it's a, I can't remember the square footage one-sided building, right? They have everything at Temple Institute they need. They even have, like, the menorah is there, the actual one they're going to use. They have all the actual stuff at the Temple Institute except for the ark. But they said they have the ark. 
They just don't have it there. They have laid their eyes on it. The only thing left is the ashes of a red heifer. And five of those got shipped out of Texas. And we heard yesterday on a podcast, they will sacrifice those, one, those five red heifers. If they are still kosher this spring, they have the ashes and that's everything they need to sanctify the temple. Okay, that, that, they have that. Kosher means it can't have one off-colored hair. They have five to pick from. They have those there. The guy has bought the property where the Bible says they have to sacrifice it. They even own that property. So everything is set up in this three and a half years that they could build the temple. The only reason it hasn't started is because we're still here and the man of peace hasn't stepped on the scene. This man of peace is probably going to be people's man of the year. He's going to win Pulitzer Prize peace. I mean, he is going to be the guy. Everybody will love him. Everybody. He's bringing total peace to the Jewish people that has never happened before. He's bringing peace to the whole world because us narrow-minded Christians are gone. He's bringing peace everywhere for three and a half years. And then it's called the abomination of desolation. And that's why I said at three and a half years, he will walk in that temple and basically say, I'm God. And he will absolutely flip the tables. It'll be the biggest double cross of all time. It's going to be the biggest double cross of all time. He's going to change everything. The Bible says at that time, two-thirds of the Jews will be cut off. Right now, there's 10 million Jews. Sorry, there's 15 million Jews right now. 10 million will die. Guys, Hamas just killed 1,400. It's in the news everywhere. 10 million will die. That's what the Bible says. Hitler killed 5 million. Hitler can't hold a candle to the Antichrist. You know, you look through time and you see all these evil leaders and you see all this. And I, I heard this one time and it never really sunk in. But you know, Satan has to have an Antichrist ready, a person ready throughout all generations because he doesn't even know when he's coming to get his bride. Hitler could have been the Antichrist. When the church is gone, he has to have a man ready for him to enter, take over, to be the Antichrist. Has to be on the scene. Has to be on the scene throughout all generations. We look at these evil people and we're like, oh, that, that's him. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I see all these people like asking, well, is this the person the Antichrist? I, I, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Christ. I could care less who the Antichrist is. I'm not going to be here. I'm looking for the Christ. But I believe we need to know that this is coming to tell people because there is people that will not accept until we're gone. And if they understand, even listen at all, if God leaves them a clear mind, totally different story, that maybe they'll accept when we're gone. Maybe they will. I, I pray that everybody accepts now. Revelation 13, 7 it doesn't say just that two-thirds of the Jews are going to be cut off. I mean, that's what the Bible says. But Revelation 13, 7 also says, And he was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them authority over every tribe and people, tongue, and nation was given to him. So it's not just the Jews. The number is going to be staggering. It's going to be everybody. He's going to wage war. He's going to be this man of peace. And he's going to have the biggest double cross ever and just start killing everybody. Killing everybody. That's what's happening when we're gone. Revelation 6, and I'm not going to read it all, and I, I gave you guys some just breakdowns. I'm going to go through them because this is where it all kind of starts with the four horsemen. And I, I got it out there for you. In Revelation 6, they, it comes on the scene after he's made the, um, the desolation there in the temple. And actually, verse 2 is actually talking about the Antichrist, the, the rider on the white horse that comes in at the very start. That's where we're at in, in 6-2, is that's when he steps on the scene and brings all this peace, okay? And isn't it kind of ironic that he's trying to ride a white horse, kind of like somebody else does at the end? You know, he's always trying to do the same things. And then it jumps in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, the red horse shows up, and this is this war we're talking about. 
It takes away complete peace on the earth that he had brought. And there's this war that will rage and kill all these people we just talked about. And then what the war doesn't kill, it talks about the next horse, the black horse. And the, the black horse is the horse of famine. Guys, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody in this room has any clue what famine would feel like. We're spoiled. We have food. So the black horse rides in, 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 in uh, verses 5 through 6 and famine, so starts killing more people. And then it gets even worse. 6, 7 through 8, then death, the ashen or the pale horse shows up, and it says that he comes with all death and Hades. So the ones that are still making it, it just gets worse. And then 6, 9 through 11, it's talking about the martyr's prayer. They're asking for the avenge of their blood. Because between 6 and 7, or 7, yeah, between, that was 5. This is the martyr's blood, the avenge for our blood. That's all the saints that are going to be coming through. Because in Revelation 7, it talks about these 144,000 Jewish men. Sealed by God, sealed by the Holy Spirit. With something on their forehead that the Antichrist and all his demons can't even bother but yet it says that they're on the scene and God has put them there for this moment and they're preaching the word, whatever that way is. There's some different thoughts on the way that you will accept afterwards. And all I'm gonna tell you is accept now, don't, let's not worry about it. But so then it finishes out there in 12 through 17 with these great earthquakes, earthquakes and the sun turns black and the, the moon turns to blood. And then it starts announcing the, tr the trumpet judgments are next. But these 144, they come on the scene. And what I like about it is when they come on the scene, look what verse 9 through 10 says in Revelation 7. Because it talks about this multitude from the tribulation. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count. From every nation, all tribes and people and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is the tribulation saints that the 144 are reaching. But we also read those scriptures last week that you have to what? Endure until the end. If you don't accept now, you don't get raptured or get to go meet the Lord the minute you pass away, which is what I believe. But if you wait till then, you have to endure until the end. Does that mean you got to make it through the seven years? Yeah. Does that mean you got to make it till you get beheaded? Yeah. That's why it's called the martyr's prayer. But there's a multitude. I don't want you to be a part of this multitude. I don't. I want you to go with us. It's going to be a lot better bus ride. But it, it is encouraging that it's such a number, so many, they came and count them. And, and this is why I was talking about the tribulation saints. They're going to be invited guests to our wedding. They don't get to be part of the wedding. They get to be there. They're our guests. I told you last week, I think John the Baptist is the best man. I'll stand on that. You can't find that in Scripture. That's opinion. But, but there's got to be a best man, right? So it goes on in Revelation 8. I told you that they're, the last thing they announced was the trumpet judgments. So the trumpet judgments are coming next in, in Revelation, okay? And we're skipping through stuff. I'm just hitting the low points. Let's put it that way. In Revelation 8, starts the trumpet judgments. And in 8, 7, it says that one-third of the vegetation is burned up by hellfire and blood falling from the sky. That doesn't even sound good. Like, does, I mean, seriously, you, you're going through all this. You're seeing all these people killed, and now it's raining fire giant hailstones and blood I told you last week this is literally hell on earth guys hell on earth and it should give us a burden and it should break our hearts for the ones that just don't get it it, it just don't get it verse 8 through 9 8 8 through 9 one third of the sea is judged it says that there's a burning mountain that is thrown into the sea and the sea turns to blood not pleasant times 8, 10 through 11, one third of the fresh water is judged. It says there is a star called Wormwood, falls from the sky and makes all the all, a third of the fresh water bitter. Do you guys know, you'd have, to, you'd have to research it, NASA found an asteroid that is on a path to possibly collide with the Earth in 2029, and the name of that asteroid is Wormwood. Look it up. 
Now, was there somebody at NASA that knows Bible prophecy and like, hey, that could hit us. I'm going to name Wormwood. I don't know, but they name it Wormwood, and it's supposed to, it has a chance of colliding with the earth in 2029. Um, prophecy unfolding. Chapter 8, 12 through 13, one third of the luminaries darkened, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars darkened. 9, 1 through 12, you don't think it gets any worse. It gets a little bit worse. There's an increase in demonic activity. There is locusts released from the bottomless pit, and they're torture, they can torture anybody except for the 144 with the seal to the point they're begging for death, and they can't die. Guys, these locusts, you read what they, if you want to read that, you want to, you want to read about something scary, read 1 through 12, 9. And look at what they're called. They're locusts, and they're, um, they look like horses prepared for battle. Their hair is like women. It's kind of weird, but I guess women are scary. I don't know. Their hair is like a woman, a teeth like a lion, and a tail like a scorpion. You tell me you're not going to be shaking in your boots? I would be. And they're released out of the bondless pit, the abyss, out of hell, and they can torture so bad that you're begging for death and it won't come. As this is what people that, are, that, that don't believe, that don't want to give their life over now, and the ones that are like, well, if you disappear, I might believe. Seriously? Seriously? Why? Why? Why would you even want to even possibly see this? 9... Uh, 9, 13 through 21, a third of mankind is killed. Four angels that are bound under the Euphrates River, they're going to be loosed. It's the angel armies that says that they, not only the angels, the four angels, but they come with 200 million with horses breathing fire and brimstone. The army of 200 million with horses breathing fire. That's a battle I want to be a part of, huh? No. No. And see, between the judgment six trumpet and the judgment seven, which is just the announcement of the bowls because it's going to get worse. There's something else that happens. And Revelation 11 is when these two witnesses show up. I told you there's 144,000 Jews and they're preaching the gospel and, they're, and then there's these two witnesses that show up on the scene. Most of people believe this is Moses and Elijah because they're the two that show up at Mount Transfiguration. So that's what most scholars believe. There's also a thought that one of them could be Enoch because he was taken up. Um, I don't think it really matters. I lean to Moses and Elijah. It just makes sense in my head. But the thing is, they're going to be on the streets, and they're going to be street preaching like never before. Tongues of fire, words of fire coming out, landing. And in Revelation 11:7, it said, when they finished their testimony, when they finished doing what they, that God had for them to say the beast comes up out of the abyss and makes war with them overcomes them and kills them so they're doing what God said to do and when, when God when they said everything that God had for them to say he comes out of the abyss to kill them the antichrist will kill them and they will lay in the streets Okay, the bible says they will lay in the streets and everyone will see them everybody in the whole world will watch this happen that's 20 years ago. I remember being sitting through Revelation studies, and they're like, everybody in the world is going to see it at once. I'm like, yeah, sure they will. How's that going to happen? Guys, I've been over other countries. I even have my phone. I can watch it on their phones. Guys, now is the technology where this stuff can actually happen. This guy right here, this book, I, I, read, I read this book a lot. He wrote this in 1918, and he wrote in there, it will say they will see it all. I don't know how it's going to happen, but the Bible says it will. We can see how that could happen. We can see how everybody in the world can watch this happen. And you know what sad is? The Bible says, you know what they do? They give gifts and they celebrate. They give gifts and they celebrate that the Antichrist has killed these two witnesses and they're laying in the streets. That's how evil this world is, is during this time. But then three and a half days later, guess what? God breathes life into them. He breathes life into them. They come back to life right there in the streets. And then the seventh judgment will be announced, the bold judgments. It'd be quite a sight to see 
And I hope we get to see it from up here, but I don't want to see it from down here. I don't want to live it. We go on to Revelation 13, and it starts talking about this dragon being cast down. Because we know that if you read your Bible and you understand that it says that the devil is the prince of the air, that first heaven, that air part is his right now, okay? And so he's cast out of that, the dragon. It says that he is cast out of heaven, that first heaven where he resides, where the UFOs come from, where the demonic realm comes from, this first heaven. And then it starts talking about in Revelation 1 and 3. Well, before that, I'll talk about it. So we talk, you'll hear three words in the, in the final days. You're going to hear about the dragon. And just think of the dragon as anti-God. Okay? You're going to hear about the beast, anti-Christ. And he will be the one that emerges out of the sea. And then you're going to hear about a false prophet. And he's the anti-spirit. Shocking that the devil would try to do an unholy trinity. A satanic trinity emerges at this time. And Revelation 1 and 3 says, And then I saw a beast coming out of the sea, so this is the Antichrist, had ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And verse 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Guess what? He kills himself and they bring him back to life. Have we seen this before? He's trying to mimic everything Jesus does. He's the antichrist. He's trying to mimic and they will kill him and they will bring him back to life. And what's it say? That they all will follow after the beast. And right after this, in verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 16, it says, and he causes all small and great, rich and poor, free men and slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So the mark of the beast will appear on the scene. Guys, you will never ever, if you're a born again Christian here, you will never ever see the mark of the beast. The vaccine was not the mark of the beast. You will never take the mark of the beast by accident. You are taking a vow to follow the antichrist. It's not gonna be snuck in on you. If you're a Christian here, you will never see it. We're gone. We're gone. But the mark shows up. The false prophet does the marking. The false Holy Spirit, anti-spirit is the one that marks them. The Holy Spirit is the one that seals 144,000. The Holy Spirit is the one that seals you and me. Guys, we can't find Christ without the Holy Spirit's Right? The Holy Spirit is on our heart. He's the one leading us to the Father. The same thing happens here. And then verse, or, uh, chapter 16 is the bowl judgments. One and two talks about malignant sores, boils. And this is for people with the mark of the beast. They get these terrible boils and sores. In verse three, it talks about the whole sea is turned to blood. Not a third. We already had a third. Now the whole thing's blood. It's getting worse. Verse 4 through 7, the fresh water to blood, all of it. 8 and 9, men scorched with fire. The sun is made so hot that it scorches. Can you imagine who's had like a sunburn with blisters and then you go back out in the sun? We already said they're covered in malignant sores and boils and now the sun is made to scorch. Verse 10 through 11 says, darkness over the kingdom of the beast. Complete darkness. Guys, the sun doesn't shine for two days. I'm in complete depression. I have the sundown blues. Darkness over the kingdom. 16, 12 through 16, the Euphrates dries up completely, allowing people from the east to basically just take over. Battles that the river used to keep them away, they can just take over. And 17 through 21 is the greatest earthquake of all time with widespread destruction. Chapter 17, Mystery Babylon shows up, Babylon the Great. And I want you to listen to how he explains Babylon the Great. The woman was in 17.4, the woman was clothed in purple, scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. 
You remember what I told you what we're adorned in? Christ's bride, we're adorned in white linens, fine and clean. A lot of people refer to this Babylon the Great as the bride of him, of the Antichrist, clothed in purple and scarlet, exact opposite. Revelation 18, the city of Babylon is rebuilt, and then this angel comes into the scene and starts talking about fallen, fallen is Babylon. They're building this up, and they think probably they're on the mend, is the way I take it. It talks about that they become so drunk, this is the scripture, they become so drunk on the wine of her passions and her immorality. You think it's immoral now? Nothing compared to what it's going to be like then. I don't even think we could even dream up how bad it's going to be then for immorality. And then we're back to us. So that's what I'm saying. What I just went over is around seven years, and all of a sudden, here we are where we started at Revelation 19, 7 through 8. And it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready, given her clothes and fine linen, bright and clean, righteous acts of the saints. So what are we doing from judgment to this? I don't know, but I bet it's going to go by like that. I don't think we're not going to care. But look what's happening in the world. Look what's happening to the people that right now don't understand there's a better way. There's an easier way. But see, now our marriage is complete, and it says what? We're in fine linen, bright and clean. We're in bright and clean. So let's, we got time. I can't believe I'm going to make it through. Let's check out the honeymoon because this is the part I love. Check out this honeymoon, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on is called faithful and true and righteous and he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and his name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in the blood and his name is called the word of God. And his armies, which are in heaven, clothed in white, fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so, that he, so with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of their fierce wrath of God, and of all, God Almighty. And his, on his robes and on his thigh is a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Guys, I'm not a horse fan, but I'm ready to ride that ride. I, did you get that? We get to saddle up behind the king of kings. We're going into a battle. How many's went into a, how many, well, I shouldn't talk about this. How many people's ever went into a fight knowing you cannot lose? None of us. I mean, you may think you're tough, but there's still a chance you're going to lose. Guys, this is, a, this is a battle that we cannot lose, and he's got a horse for me and you. We're in the white linen. That is us. So our honeymoon, we get to get married and we get to go with him and take this world back over. This is when when he's coming. This is his second coming that the Jews were all looking for. This is when he comes and sets on his foot on the Mount of Olives and he rules with this rod of iron after this battle. And this battle, if you guys know, it's the battle in the Valley of Megiddo. It's about the Valley of Armageddon. Like he will wage war with a tongue of fire and we're right behind him on our white horses. I probably will like that horse. I've not had too many horses I like. Me and horses don't get along. I bet I get along with this one. I'm excited for this day. I'm excited for this is the honeymoon we get to go. We get to go back and we get to rule in this world. And we get to go with him and watch him fight this battle. And I don't want people to miss being able to go with us. You know, next week we're going to cover what's next. What's next is a thousand-year reign, and we'll dive into that. And then there's a, then we're taken up again, burns the whole world and renovates it, and then we're to eternity. And we'll we'll cover that next week. But like, guys, this, I wanted to cover this because it's not covered in the church enough. And guys, we got to have a passion for the lost because of this. Like if we if this doesn't break your heart, that I guarantee it when you're in here, the people in this room, they know people that are not on their way to heaven. If that doesn't break our heart, just the low points of what I told you should. How bad you gotta hate somebody to not tell them? 
How bad do you got to hate somebody not to tell them what, what can happen in the end if they don't go with us? I'm not saying they can't find Christ because, and I told you guys, this is, I know several people. One of them is a Masonic Jew pastor, and I, I have a lot of respect for him, man. He knows, he can read the original stuff. He doesn't believe there's any hope for a Gentile. He believes it's called the time of the Gentiles for a reason because it goes back to Jewish. It goes back to God working with his people, and Christ has got his bride. I, I believe right there, you know, we read it earlier that every tongue, there's going to be a multitude. So I lean towards there's still hope, but what if there's not? What if, there's, what if our hope is over as a Gentile the minute he comes get his bride? Isn't that another reason just to tell more people? I mean, I'm wanting to wrap all this up with the reason we're going over this is because we've got to evangelize. And we make it way too hard. When I was in Nicaragua, I learned that the word of God evangelizes. You could read scripture because I didn't speak their language and my interpreters were awesome, but we would give them scriptures, the Romans road, and we would see people get saved from the scripture. We make it way too hard, but we gotta understand what is coming and then that should push us, not here, we come here to get this, to build for the, I mean, listen, if you're not saved in here, today's your day. Like, today's your day. Last week was those two young people's day, and it was awesome. We sign a mirror over here, just, and that's what those mirrors are, guys. The one on the right, well, the one on the right corner got too full. People that accepted Christ that we know of. The next one on the right is, we started another one, and the one on the left is people, they put names on there that they're praying for salvation. And the reason Dustin started that, because when you write that name, you may be the one that can lead him to the Lord. You look at yourself while you're writing it. But we celebrate for those, but you know what? Heaven's looking for one more. Christ is looking for one more. I think Christ is literally looking at his father like, come on, it's time. I've waited 2,000 years. I've waited 2,000 years. Let me go get my church. Guys, I want you to be part of the church. I want you to go with us to this joyful occasion. I want you to be working on that judgment seat of Christ because you can change that. We're still here. We can start changing the crowns we're getting, start changing our highlight film. But most of all, if you don't know Christ, today's your day. And if you, if you know somebody that doesn't know Christ, bring them to these altars. As we put padding here so you can stay longer now. We got padding at the altars now. That way you can stay longer if you like. I believe the altar is very important. In the Bible, everything they did, they started an altar. They had somebody that they wanted to reach out to. They got across something. They started an altar and they built an altar and they went to the Lord. And they gave it to him or they praised him for it. I promise everybody in this room has something they can praise him for or somebody they can bring to him right now to his feet and say, God, if it's me, put, put the right words in my mouth that I can help lead them to Christ. I look forward to next week. Come, we'll finish up. And then uh, Pastor D will be back after that. But I want you to seriously search your soul right now. Make sure you're ready. And then most of all, think about the ones that you know that need to go that need to be with us on that, that joyful day when he steps out on that cloud. It's not his second coming. He doesn't touch the ground. He comes on that cloud and is like, come on, church, let's go. And we're all going to go together. I'm excited. I'm excited, and I hope you are. So the altar is yours. Let's give the Lord a hand and some praise this morning. Amen. So, folks, we're so glad you're here. Uh, if We have the tithe boxes on the wall next to the door. Download the Church Center app if you haven't already. That thing is so handy. Hey, uh, I, I forgot to tell you guys. Is that better? I, uh, there is two. There's one from last week, if you didn't get it, the Judgment Seat of Christ um, handout. And there is one on the Book of Revelation. Just you better have good eyes. But you're welcome to them. They're up here on the stage. In the corner back here, um, we have the baskets that we're going to auction off for the missionary stuff. Oh, and uh, this picture, the resolution's not real good. So Wednesdays, we're going to start this uh, study of chapter or season three of The Chosen. If you have not watched The Chosen yet, this scene right here 
it's kind of hard to tell, is the woman at the well. Has anybody watched that, that episode? Is that not awesome? If you want to understand, if you want to watch The Chosen or not, Google The Chosen Woman at the Well and watch the scene, okay? Because it's going to be wonderful. The season is wonderful. Guys, I cannot make the Bible any easier to understand than doing The Chosen. So, and we're, folks, we're glad you're here. It's 15 degrees outside, um, and we have pipes to unfreeze. I get it, but thank you so much for giving the Lord a week of your, or an hour of your day. Let's pray.